So let's talk about Cold War II. I was actually going to segue to your thinking and observations of the not mutually exclusive combination of maybe conditions that have been set over the last five to 10 or more years that are now leading to certain types of inertia in terms of trends, converging trends that may or may not be avoidable. Then there's a lot of wiggle room with independent actors and and so on, as we've discussed. But I've, I've read you describe Cold War II, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, as uh, China senior partner, Russia junior partner, Right. in contrast to Cold War I. If you were placing bets on likely events or developments over the, the next handful of years, what would you put out as perhaps some reasonably probable scenarios that we'll see develop? The cliche quote often ascribed to Mark Twain is that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. But he never said that. Twain never used those words. That's a made-up quote. What Twain actually said back in the 1870s was that history was a bit like a kaleidoscope, and as you turned it, certain patterns could repeat themselves. So let's think about this as, as a kaleidoscope. Hmm. You'll remember those things we had as kids where you kind of stick it oh, to yes. your eye, and it's like, hmm, that's psychedelic. What happens if I turn, oh, that's also psychedelic, but different. Cold War One had certain common features with Cold War II, and, and there were certain very important differences. So we shouldn't expect things to play out exactly the same. On the other hand, it's clear that we have an ideological rivalry between the United States uh, and the People's Republic of China. There is clearly a technological race going on. There is also a geopolitical dimension to this, a conventional territorial dimension. And and this is a point Graham Allison made in his book, Destined for War, there's some probability that they end up in a hot war. Because what's a cold war? George Orwell coined the phrase to, to mean a peace that is no peace. It is something that has latent the possibility of an actual hot war. And I think the United States and China have been in this kind of cold war situation for at least four years, maybe longer. I think the Chinese would probably say longer, but we didn't notice. We didn't notice the beginning of Cold War One either. When Orwell talks about Cold War in 1945 and Churchill in 1946 talked about an Iron Curtain, most Americans were, no, no, no. The Stalin's been our ally in World War II. You're just warmongering. And um, it took until 1950, when there was a hot war in Korea, for most Americans to say, ah, maybe they're right. I mean, Kennan wasn't immediately hailed as a prophet when he talked about containment. The, the thing about Cold Wars is that, by and large, people in the West don't really notice their beginning and take a while to understand the scale of the challenge. So we're at that early Cold War stage. I think that's a good analogy. That works well. And also, this war in Ukraine is like the Korean War. It's the first hot war of Cold War II, and it makes you kind of get that you're in a Cold War. As in Cold War I, the hot war happens in a slightly unexpected location. The hot war that kicked off Cold War I was Korea. And the US hadn't really been paying very close attention to Korea when that, that kicked off. So if you take this kind of approach and recognize that there are similarities, except that instead of a nuclear arms race, we're in an AI race and a quantum computing race. If you recognize the difference, which is there's much more economic interpenetration between the US and China than there ever was between the US and the Soviet Union, you're then in a position to start hazarding guesses about what happens next, which is what you asked me to do. And th these are, are very difficult things to get right. And, and I often think that if one makes a right prediction, it's more luck that it turns out to be right than judgment. Because this is a complex system of enormous complexity. So we're, when we try to say anything about global politics, we're, we're really engaged in, in an exercise beyond our human brains. But let me have a go. Right now, the US and China are on collision course over Taiwan. And it, Taiwan is to this Cold War what Cuba was to the last Cold War. It's the flashpoint. 
it's an island in close proximity to one of the players. Then it was close to the US. This time it's close to China. It's an island which seems to be worth more than its territorial size would suggest. Actually, Taiwan's more important than Cuba ever was because Taiwan is where 92% of the most sophisticated semiconductors in the world are manufactured by TSMC. And so in some ways, the potential for a crisis over Taiwan is higher than the potential ever was for a crisis over Cuba. So I think what happens next is that we end up with a showdown over, over Taiwan at some point in the next few years. It could be in 2024 when there's an election scheduled in Taiwan. And it would also make sense to do it then from a Chinese point of view, because who knows who will be president in 2025, but probably not somebody as completely incompetent as Joe Biden. So my sense is that the crisis is not far away, even although the Chinese don't look terribly ready for a full-blown invasion. And that's the thing that, that I'll be watching most closely in the coming years. The other thing to remember is, and this again is, is in the nature of a guess, that a characteristic feature of Cold War I was that crises would happen in multiple locations at roughly the same kind of time. So the Middle East always mattered, and it was the place where things would periodically blow up. I think the Middle East is about to blow up again because the Iranian regime clearly has an incentive to get into a war, because when it's at war, it can slaughter domestic opposition with much greater ease. Uh, so I'm afraid that we're probably going to see a Middle Eastern crisis even before Taiwan blows up. And what worries me the most, Tim, is that the lesson of Cold War I is that we only narrowly avoided World War Three, as I said already. So if we're in this kind of a scenario where there are crises in Eastern Europe, potentially in the Middle East, potentially in the Far East, I think just keeping this a Cold War will be quite a challenge. That will be a good outcome if we just say, hmm, that was Cold War II. And it'll be a great outcome if it ends the same way as Cold War I with peaceful victory for the West. But there is no guarantee at this point that Cold War II stays cold. And there is no guarantee at this point that the United States and its allies win. And that's the real lesson of Cold War I. It was not inevitable that it stayed cold, and it was not inevitable that we won.